Today is Canada's first ever National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, a new federal statutory holiday for people to pause and reflect on the legacy of residential schools in this country. That history brought firmly into the national public consciousness last spring by the discoveries of hundreds of unmarked burial sites on the grounds of former residential schools. Now, first, it happened in Kamloops, British Columbia, and then there were others right across this country, the process of discovery that will continue in the years ahead. Now, this day was first proposed by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission back in 2015. It was number 80 in the 94 calls to action, calling on the federal government to establish a statutory holiday to honor survivors, their families, and their communities, and to ensure that public commemoration of the history and legacy of residential schools remains a vital component in the reconciliation process. The bill creating the holiday received royal assent in June. Now, many of our viewers have sent in questions about truth and reconciliation. So to answer them, we are joined now by Pam Palmiter. She's a Mi'kmaq lawyer and the chair in Indigenous Governance at Ryerson University. Pam, thank you so much for making time for us on this very important day. Thanks for covering this. So Pam, let's, before we get into the viewer questions, you know, so much of your life is dedicated to this topic, this issue, this, this fight. So I'm curious from your point of view, what is the purpose of this day? I think for me, this day is about grounding Canada's history and present together. Instead of having a one-off apology or a one-off event, now this is a part of Canada. Year after year after year, we're going to not only have to remember what happened in the past, but how that links to current injustices so that we can take steps each year to make sure we never do these things again. Okay, that kind of leads into our first viewer question, actually, because Marilyn asked, what does this day mean and how should Canadians celebrate? And she put celebrate in quotation marks, which seems pertinent because you don't necessarily want to celebrate what we're marking today. So how would you answer Marilyn? Well, I think it's a really important question. And even the question mark around the word celebrate, I've had lots of people ask me about that. And if you look at, there's multiple definitions for the word celebrate. Celebrate can also mean to honor, to engage in solemn ceremony and an act of memorial. And I think that's exactly what this day is supposed to do. It's supposed to acknowledge all of the children and families who were devastated by residential schools and the kids who never made it home, be intentional about learning about it. And then also seeking out the ongoing truth, the links between residential schools and what's happening today, like the foster care crisis, like what happened in the 60s scoop, murder to missing Indigenous women and girls, and take steps to act on it. Okay, and what would that act look like for you? Well, I think Canadians, keep in mind who works for, who are social workers, who's police officers, who's teachers and educators, who's healthcare, who works in government, who works in policing, it's Canadians. So Canadians within their jobs can make sure that they move ahead in a relationship with Indigenous peoples that's not based on racism and violence as it currently is. They also have the numbers, the power, the influence and the wealth to call on governments to act on very specific measures. Take, for example, they could tell the government within your first 100 days of office in this new parliament, you can stop fighting residential school survivors in court. You can stop fighting First Nation kids in foster care in court and stop fighting against First Nations women who are trying to end sex discrimination in the Indian Act and who are excluded from their communities. Those are things that can be done literally within a matter of weeks and Canadians have a role in pushing that forward. Okay, our next question comes from Paul and it's a big one, but it's an important one. So Paul's wondering, what do we know about actually how so many Indigenous children died in the residential school system? Well, that's an, another really important question because the issue of tracking and information and access to documentation and vital statistics, that was all covered in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearings and evidence uh, and also in the report. We have a problem with knowing the full extent of the numbers because in some cases they stopped tracking the names of who died in residential schools. They stopped noting the cause of death. And of course, when uh, the deaths were getting really, really large in number and they were being exposed in the media by people like Dr. Peter Bryce, then in some cases, some locations stopped tracking the deaths at all. 
add that together with unmarked graves, and it's pretty hard to know exactly how many. Now, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation is actually putting together what's known as a death registry to take all of the information that we know, all of the testimony, and try to properly categorize and note all of the deaths and where they were located in the children's names. So hopefully as the years go on, they'll be able to compile that. They're upwards about 4,100 people right now, uh, but they've only gone through about a fifth of all of the evidence. Oh, wow. Okay, let's turn now to Magnus who tweeted to ask us, did everyone attending residential schools after 1948 do so voluntarily? Oh, the clear answer to that is no. And here's why. Because Canada and, you know, federal, provincial governments, churches have not always acted inside of the law. Here's a prime example. Uh, it used to be such that uh, Indian agents and RCMP officers used to tell people that they couldn't leave the reserve, that it was against the law and they could be imprisoned. There was no law that prevented them from leaving the reserve, but they just acted like it. So even when different laws started to change around residential schools, uh, many of the church officials and government officials and even police officers would tell uh, families and children that they weren't allowed to leave, that they had to go to these uh, residential schools. And even children who should have aged out, who were legally adults, were often told, you can't leave. It's still the law that you have to be here. So there's, there's always a disconnect between what the law is and what the practice was. Okay. Now, the next question comes from Steve, also on Twitter, but it's, it's a theme, Pam, that we saw a lot online, which is this issue of financial priorities. Now, wouldn't the money going to pay federal workers for an extra vacation day be better spent providing people with drinking water? I think the answer to this question is really, we don't have to do either or. It's not about what is the one solution or the one step that we have to do. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission had 94 calls to action. So yes, they called for a national statutory holiday to make this firmly grounded in Canada. And that's important. I think all of the provinces should follow suit as well. But we should also prioritize water on every First Nation reserve in every single household, prioritize housing, make sure that the, there's proper access to food, access to health care without racism, you know, all of these things, access to education are all important. We don't have to choose. Pam, just quickly before I let you go, how are we doing on those 94 recommendations? Sadly, we're not doing so great. They've had some progress on some. We've had a national inquiry into murdered and missing. We've had some movement on uh, creating a pathway forward on that. We've had this national holiday. There's been legislation to intended to protect Indigenous languages. They passed legislation finally to implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So they have taken some steps, but they still have a very long way to go. And contrary to popular conception. It's not going to take 500 years to address all of these things if they put their minds to it. They could do a significant amount of these calls to action within their first 100 days of office. Okay. Pam Palmiter is a Mi'kmaq lawyer and the chair in Indigenous Governance at Ryerson University. Pam, thank you so much for your time today. Anytime.